Sí, te, pues, te ves, pensé. <laughs> okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for showing up for my B exam. Thank you everyone also online to like log in at whatever hour it is where you are right now. Um, my thesis topic is driving simulation for interaction. It's work, as Wendy mentioned, that I've been doing over the last five years here at Conaltech, supervised by Wendy Du. Before I start showing you all kinds of fun videos and the systems that I've built and sort of highlight why they're interesting and relevant and how they move us forward as, uh, when we think about interaction, I want to quickly talk about interaction and specifically interaction with automation. Right? So the introduction of autonomous features in cars, be it like advanced driver's assistance systems or even semi-autonomous vehicles, has changed significantly how uh, and what kind of questions we ask from driving simulators. We've switched away from questions of control, like can the driver control a car or are they getting distracted by this MIA system, to questions of trust and collaboration between people and the autonomous system as it's driving. Questions of trust and collaboration are inherently formed through the interactions that you have with the system, interactions that you have with the system in many different contexts, right? And so a couple of things that we now need from simulators that are much more important now than they were before is that we need highly immersive environments so we can construct these uh, environments in context convincingly. And also we want to have these simulators be easily replicable so that we can easily try out lots of, so we can easily try them out in lots of different environments and different contexts and understand also how culturally uh, there are differences and in how people inter, inter, expect interactions to take place. So ultimately what we would want to do, especially when we think about lots of different contexts, is we want to bring elements of the real world into the driving simulations. We need some way of controlling the scenarios we're testing. However, otherwise we would want to bring in as many of these real world aspects and like immersion as possible. So that we can discover how interaction between people and automation actually takes place and develops over time. This was what I was trying to do in my thesis. The first system that I built was, uh, was built in, this is actually the first video that I built at Stanford with the, with the internship. It's still also part, uh, it's still also originated in my master's thesis and then later was continued here at Colonel Tech, was the room system where we were trying to use sort of the real world element of being in a car and driving in a real car. It's just that we're replacing the visual element uh, of, the driving, of the driving experience so that we could simulate the scenario that we are interested in. And so what you see here is that uh, we are here in the car uh, on the left side, you see the participant that is wearing a virtual reality headset with a hand tracker attached to it. And then on the bottom left, you can see what the participant is actually seeing as they're driving through the real world. Um, and so this was the first implementation, the first demo that actually worked that we did in 2018. So you can see in the background of the car, we're moving. So we're measuring the motion of the car, replicating it in VR. And uh, so have the experience of driving in a vehicle because you are sitting in a vehicle. It's just as the scenario that you're seeing, slightly different. We replicated the system at Cornell Tech and then actually also extended it by introducing even more elements of the real world into the simulator. At this point, we are only replacing and adding visual elements to the, scenario, uh, to the field of view from the participant that we're actually interested in by using mixed reality systems. So in this case, you can see we are replacing these traffic cones that the participant is trying to navigate around. If you look at the top left screen, you can see the video recording just from a camera and you can't see any of the traffic cones, but in the bottom, uh, in the bottom half of the screen, you can see the simulated virtual traffic cones uh, as the participant is trying to navigate around them. I will talk more about these systems in detail later, of course. And then the last simulator that uh, I, I, I finished with uh, last year and then sort of we've been running studies with is called Strangeland. The goal of the Strangeland simulator is while it is much more controlled and much more a traditional simulator where we're not in a car and moving around, you can see the participants are sitting next to each other. It is actually a multiplayer driving simulator. So the idea is, can we bring multiple people together in the same environment and look at how the interaction takes place? and ideally also build it in a way that we can deploy them in many different environments. And so this is how this looks like. On the bottom right, you can see what the participant on the right is seeing. On the bottom left, you can see what the participant on the left is seeing. And you can see how we, we like, how, how they try to navigate through sort of ambiguous traffic situations. This just as a teaser, we'll get back to this later. 
all of this work was published as research platforms. And by that, we have sort of a specific meaning or specific definitions of, 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 of what we mean by that. First, we try to make them as accessible as possible to other researchers. So we publish system details, the study protocols to replicate the work, and example data. In the work itself and in the papers, we showed the usability of these platforms by running either proof of concept studies or validation studies or things like that. All of the systems are built in Unity and made a sort of with a modular approach. Simple changes to the environment, you know, replacing the traffic cones with a different object should not require any coding. It should be easy enough to do if you have a slightly different research question. And finally, they are also supposed to be extensible, such that they're open source, usable, and scalable. And we can actually see that all this already, we've already like started to hit the goal of having other people also use uh, the systems. We, of course, fall into a wide range of already existing work. We're not the first ones to build driving simulators. This is what I mentioned earlier. There are many uh, driving, many are driving simulators that already exist. And if you look again at the two dimensions that I laid out in the beginning about sort of creating immersive experiences and having reproducibility, this is kind of where the related work falls. We've clustered the immersiveness into three, sort of a level of immersion into three different groups. At the bottom, we have static simulators that might have a car chassis, uh, might, have just, might just be a computer screen, but they're not moving the participant in any way. We have motion simulators. These are simulators that have motion bases that move around to, to create a felt sense of motion. And then at the, at the top, we have sort of more immersive simulators that use an experiment vehicle and use the motion of the vehicle to create scenarios. And then on the, on the axis at the bottom, try to sort of spread out a little bit of sort of the, the availability of reproducing these systems, how much open source code is available, how much is of the hardware definitions are available. Um, and sort of looking at these, uh, at, the, at the availability of the, of the work um, and, the, uh, and sort of the, the contributions that we were trying to do, we managed with the introduction of XR Room and Room introduce relatively reproducible uh, systems relative to sort of the system systems that are highly immersive compared to some of the more even like some of the motion simulation or the other existing sort of experiment vehicle simulations. With Strangeland, we went a totally different route where we decided to still go with a very static and traditional simulator, but try to push it very much forward towards a more of a kind of a open platform approach where people can reuse the code and implement their own kinds of studies and simulations. So one of the things that I mentioned in the beginning is sort of talking about real world complexity, letting sort of your situations unfold in a, in a naturalistic setting. And ideally, we would want to fall, fall somewhere between these two, right? So on the one side, we have a lab study. So this is, this is a picture of the NAT simulator. It's like a very expensive 12 degrees of freedom simulator. It can take the participant in all kinds of directions. Um, and it's so very expensive setup. Um, and then on the on, on the other side, we have sort of instrumented free driving where um, this is this is an example of a study that is still under review, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still under review where uh, where uh, members of the lab sort of recorded um, Re uh, re recorded drives uh, from with participants and sort of see how interactions unfold on the on the road. And so what we want to do is we want to, with the simulators that I've built, we wanted to fall somewhere between these two. So not a fully controlled lab study, um, but also not something that's completely open where we have very little control over the, over the scenario. It should be a naturalistic sort of environment, not natural, naturalistic between these two things. The first system that I will talk about is Vroom, just as I also started with as the first video. Um, I will not talk in a lot of detail about it, also because working on the system was cut a little bit short because of the pandemic. Um, I will talk about how that then led to the follow-up systems. This mostly looks at sort of the ex like the experience inside of a vehicle as a, uh, as, as a more of a traditional driving simulator setup. And we fall within this range, we kind of fall sort of in between in, in between like a lab study and an instrumented uh, driving driving study. Um, as I add the other as I add the other um, simulators here to the map, it makes clear for why this belongs here. We'll just, we'll just like, keep going with this. This 
is the uh, this is an example of the system working in the Netherlands. This is part also of the uh, publication that we did uh, out of this work, and it's the first time where the system was working. Um, there is significant drawbacks of how the system was working. We needed to drive on an empty parking lot because of the tracking was very limited, and we needed to sort of readjust all the time to make sure that we're still driving on the on the same road. And you can see on the on the on the top left side, you can see what the participant is seeing. And we're trying to see if we can even use a system like this, like the combination of a virtual reality headset inside of a car. Like, does this even work? Can we produce scenarios and can we elicit reactions from participants? And this is something we could show with the system. Then later, uh, so we actually continued this work here at Roosevelt Island. And this is not a great shot. I'll, I'll show more of the video in a second. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to actually improve the tracking so we can use a bigger area and also actually use real roads that so we don't always have to find a large parking lot to run these studies in. And so this led to the first work of implementing our first uh, like digital twin of Roosevelt Island. This is sort of the very first version that you'll see now from, I think it must have been in 2018 when we started working on this with Hamish. Um, and uh, we also managed to improve the tracking by using sort of different sensors that are of higher quality and higher refresh rates and everything. And one thing that I can show you here is that you can see here, this is the Queensboro Bridge in VR as we're driving with the tracking system. And this is actually the same Queensboro Bridge in the same, the, the same um, point. And so with this improved tracking and with this improved uh, sort of algorithms and implementation, we were able to have fully simulated driving. So this is us driving um, behind um, Bloomberg, um, behind the Bloomberg building here on Roosevelt Island. So, um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the, the work on Vroom was a little bit cut short because of the, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we, we couldn't, we are at the point that you saw the, the video, this was sort of an intermediate step. This was not really meant for publication. We just wanted to show how far we've gotten. And then the next step would have been to actually design a study and then start running participants. However, if you note, if you maybe remember from the very beginning, there were three people in the car together, one having to run the system, one having to drive the car and one participant. That's not really a possibility. It's not really something we could do at the beginning of 2020 uh, or 2021. Um, and so we needed to come up with a different way. Still though, with Room itself, we managed to introduce an immersive low cost simulator. You can use it in, in, in any car and use a lot of the different uh, VR equipment that's out there available. Um, we could show how you can reproduce and run these experiments. And of course, also made it adaptable and implemented it in Unity, feature of which we actually used ourselves directly, also in the next simulator. So because of the pandemic kind of needed to put a, put a halt on it, we thought, what can we do next? What can we do more with the simulator? How can we bring more of the real world experience in and uh, sort of enhance the simulator? And so we look more at the experience around the vehicle, right? Sort of expanding the orbit a little bit. With this, we managed to move much closer to the sort of in a, a real world driving experience where we are trying to, where we're trying to construct much less of the scenario itself. We only put in small amounts. This also means that sometimes it's much, much more difficult to, con to construct these scenarios if there's a lot of noise in the environment, but still, we, we can by adding by, by adding certain small visual elements to show uh, how this looks like we created a few sort of demo prototypes of what we imagine the system could be used for one is sort of wizarded autonomy here as an example what would be if an android is driving your car We can show that we can have on road, we have sort of on road events happening. This could be a child running over a street, but since we're on Roosevelt Island, we added another ghost to the mix. We can think about in vehicle displays and interaction patterns. Now, these are browser windows as an example of what this could be, but since they are fixed relative to the vehicle, you could imagine all kinds prototyping, media centers, interactions inside of the vehicle, uh, and these kinds of things. And then finally, one very common uh, research is to do situational awareness testing, where you see if people are actually paying attention. <laughs> and so the question is, do people actually see the moment when there is something strange in the environment? And so also, this is something that you can do with the system. 
let's say give a bit of a technical overview because ultimately we still build these systems and make them work and that's actually quite exciting i think um i wanted to give a bit of a technical overview excel room itself is uh, a the to or, or to make excel room work is a sort of a stacked tracking problem first we need to figure out where is a car in the world and where is it moving and then we need to figure out where is the participant's heads pointing relative to the car and where is the car relative to the participant in the sense of uh, for the for occluding objects as well and the way that we do this we use a stereo uh, a stereo color camera the z2 that constructs a 3d image of the environment and then looks at how this sort of 3d picture changes over time to tell us how have we've moved over time it also includes an imu that sort of measures the motion um, of the camera and then tries to interpolate between camera frames because it's not so fast the smart track 3 which is just a so regular motion tracking system um, tracks the motion of the headset relative to the car it's mounted to the vehicle so it's always there and sort of figuring out the constant offset between the smart track 3 and the z2 allows us to figure out where in the real world or in, uh, in, in, in relative coordinates is the headset of the participant and then using this in unity we can actually render virtual objects relative to the real world we also had a complete second secondary um, ROS validation stack running that sort of was validating the motion of the vehicle over time. Part of the validation of a system is not just building up, but we also need to show that you can actually use it. It's no point if it's like works fancily, but we, you can't use it. The first thing that we did is figuring out cockpit tasks. And so these cockpit tasks are mostly based on what insurance companies tell you, you should teach your kid when, when you tell them to drive or driving school websites tell you like these are the things you want to make sure um, your, your child can do. And so these are some of the basic tasks you need to do in a car. And um, we wanted to make sure that the headset itself is not going to get into the way or the camera of the headsets uh, actually work reliably enough um, such that participants can see, uh, can, can, can operate the vehicle safely. Also, it's a very it's a it's a very important precondition. We wouldn't let participants drive who can't um, who can't uh, fulfill these tasks. And then we also had a driving task where the participant itself was driving the vehicle. These driving tasks were relatively simple and straightforward uh, tasks. You can see that these dots on the different pages are traffic cones that we had placed at eight meter di distances on a parking lot and then told the participants to drive around these traffic cones. We had three different conditions where we did this uh, with, a, with a within subject design, a study design, where one time the participant would drive around these cones without a headset. They would drive around these cones once with the headset and real cones, and then once with a headset and virtual cones. Um, and we would measure how, how good they are at driving through this. I'll talk about this in a little bit. All of these tasks were, of course, designed to be at low speeds. So we did not expect participants to drive much faster than maybe 10 miles an hour um, and sort of follow along in the path due to, due to sort of safety concerns. Here's an example how this looked like for the, uh, for the cockpit tasks. And this is actually one of the cockpit tasks that was, was the hardest, which was to see the to see the uh, indicator lights. So what you see in the in the in the major part of the screen is what we recorded from the headset itself. The little turquoise dot that you see that is jumping around is the eye tracker, so you can tell where the participant is looking or where they're trying to see something. And in the top right corner, you see the 360 camera that um, recorded the participant. And the leg. <laughs> that I've engaged it, disengaged it, verbally explain which indicator lights are visible. Indicator lights, I assume like up here, I can faintly see zero miles per hour. I can see, I can make that bit to be fuel. Time is 2.28, fuel is full. I cannot read what's on the right there. I cannot read the small engine light or any of that um, to the left of the miles per hour. Um, hold on, oh, stop. And then also to show how this would work with the, this is, this is an example of a driving task where the participant had to correct for, um, uh, for driving slightly in the, in the wrong direction. 
Um, again, on the top left, you can see the view outside of the car. In the bottom left, you see the view from the participant, uh, from the participant's headset point of view with the virtual cones and the eye tracking, uh, the, the, the gaze tracking dot. On the bottom right, this is the recreation of the motion in the ROS system. And on the top right, you see the participant as they are operating the vehicle wearing the headset. Uh, There will be audio in a second. Okay. All right, I need to back up a little. I should have mentioned that what the what the participant is trying to do is to do the this step of the task. I should have mentioned this earlier. So take a right turn. It's a little bit late for the right turn, and then three consecutive left turns um, as part. Also, also the driving uh, tasks were based on um, what you what uh, driving schools and uh, what driving schools advice you would practice with a, with a uh, learner driver. Somehow. We needed to measure, or well, not somehow, but we needed to show that uh, that participants were actually able to drive the vehicle and that they were able to control it and have sort of a predictable path and follow a predictable path while wearing the VR headset. We did this by uh, computing for shade distances. Basically, for shade distances, given a spline, so uh, sort of a path through a space, it can. Uh, tell the distance that it would have. It can compute a distance measure that shows the the, the distance between that that shows sort of the difference between an ideal path uh, and the actual driven path. Um, so you can see here on the very right side, on the, with the blue line, we have the ground truth it has a Fichet distance zero because it's the same thing. Um, a, a path driven that is close, that is relatively close, has a distance of about 0.1. And then for 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 di for paths that where participants make mistakes, I had to do additional curves to correct for for driving. The Fréchet distance were slightly higher. <coughs> Within the uh, between the different conditions, so these these conditions are here. Not wearing a mixed reality headset. In the middle, we have wearing a mixed reality headset, but driving with real cones. And on the very right, um, wearing a virtual, virtual reality, a mixed reality headset, and having to drive around with uh, uh, virtual cones. We could show that there is not a significant uh, difference in how well they are able to perform these tasks. We had the same amount of people making mistakes uh, across almost like uh, we had the same amount of outliers of participants completely getting lost when while driving. And also, um, there's no significant difference between the uh, between the uh, conditions of not uh, um, no mixed reality headset or any of the other uh, mixed reality headset conditions, be it with real cones or with virtual cones. So part of the contribution of Extra Room was really looking into um, how can we can we use this kind of system and how can we do this. Um, so the, per, the, the, the first contribution of, of X room should, uh, should, that should also be noted is the COVID safe study protocols. We spend a lot of time figuring out how can we make sure that only one participant is, uh, or only one person is in the car at the same time. What are the cleaning regimens that we need to do to make sure that we can guarantee that no one's going to get sick? This was even at the beginning when we weren't sure, when we didn't know to what extent surfaces are a, a transmissible surface, uh, a transmissible uh, I don't know way to get COVID, um, and so these are. Uh, this is this was quite quite a lot of work to get, to make sure that we didn't get anyone sick while running our study. Um, while running the study itself, we discovered a lot of sort of hardware and software limitations. 
uh, that played a role. So there are some basic human factors problems. If you have a tall person and, and they are wearing a VR headset uh, in the car, this led to a few problems where people were, would hit the headset into the roof of the car um, or, uh, or, or, the, or the side of the, of the car and like got stuck uh, a little bit. Uh, other problems were more from a sort of like hardware nature where uh, the headset that we were using was the Valdro XR1, which is a headset that has two cameras that then feed forward the view of these cameras into the screen. So it's a regular VR headset with two cameras that are really fast and high quality. Um, however, even though this was a headset designed for this kind of use, it still had significant limitations. One problem, and this is what we saw earlier in the cockpit task, was the aliasing, so ref refresh rate aliasing between the headset the, between the headsets, cameras, and the displays of the car. So they would refresh just off enough so that you couldn't actually read what the displays were showing. And then also there are, di there are dynamic range uh, limits on it. So if you would look down into the car, it would take a few seconds to adjust to the, to the darker light conditions. And then also if you would look, look up quickly, um, it would uh, cause, uh, it, it would basically white out for a few seconds on the, on the outside view. So you couldn't really see what's, what's going on in the outside. And so this is some of the technical limitations that we saw using this headset. Um, however, we are like excited to see that there are like new developments happening in the direction uh, of these headsets, and we'll see uh, if maybe I don't know the introduction of Apple's headset now gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, to run these studies with a more sort of reliable system that is not prone <laughs> or dependent on these on these limitations. Um, yeah, and again, obviously, this was published as a research platform with all of the uh, all of the open source code available um, and the protocols and everything to hope, hopefully have people replicate the system. So now we come to the last simulator that I've built. Um, it's actually two implementations of the same simulator, but it, this is a simulator that very much looks at the interaction that takes place between different traffic participants or different road, between different uh, road users. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Strangeland falls much closer on the side of a lab study because the, we have the virtual environment is controlled, the, uh, the starting points are controlled. Um, but still, the reason that we're pulling this slightly out of a lab study is we're trying to bring multiple people in together and let them interact naturalistically, interpret the environment naturalistically as they, um, as they wish, uh, based also on like interpret the instructions that we give them in the way that they think they can achieve the goal and then see how these scenarios play out. Why is this relevant and why is this interesting? So one of the, one of the systems, one of the reasons that we built this was to look at cultural differences. Like the system is intentionally designed to be affordable. I have a couple of more information on that later. But the idea was like, there are lots of sort of local driving and cultural norms and how about driving and how can we actually build a system that allows us to capture these interactions. Here, this is an example uh, from Japan where it's uh, customary, at least in some regions, I guess, uh, to turn to use the hazard lights for a few seconds to say thank you, uh, that someone let you in or let you pass. It's very subtle, it's very quick, but uh, it's something that's important to do. Obviously, we're not the first ones to build like multi-participant driving simulators. There, there's a, there's a, the, the, there's a mosaic simulator from the uh, DLR in Germany, where there are multiple participants can drive in the same environment. There are simulators from the Uni University of Leeds in England, uh, where, uh, where multiple participants uh, can sort of interact in the same environment. However, um, one of the main drawbacks of these simulators is that if you look at them, they're already relatively extensive in their system setup already, in, in, in their sort of hardware setup. So if you look at the mosaic simulator, it already is, it uses sort of a half built vehicle cabin with multiple screens and a complete driver uh, a driving setup. And then the uh, simulator at Ulitz uses sort of a cave setup with multiple projectors and motion tracking and head tracking to create this experience. Um, if you're really interested in replicating the study in lots of different spaces, it's a lot to ask someone to implement or it's a lot to ask someone to build up uh, and like forget about shipping something like this, right? Systems are built once and then used in a place. Um, so alternatively, this was supposed to be a different slide. Um, 
uh, okay. Uh, how come Nate earlier made pictures of the actually updated version and I put them in, but somehow I must have skipped the wrong slide. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but this is, this is basically, um, so what we're trying to do is to build a system that's easily shippable that we can move around um, and so test driving cultures in lots of different environments. Um, this, is a, this is a system that we built packed up together into one small suitcase um, where we have two, two gaming steering wheels. The VR headsets are hidden behind uh, bubble wrap and then the laptop's driving it. And actually the newer version that I wanted to show you but somehow skipped uh, the, the wrong pictures of actually now nowadays uses only one laptop and the sort of modern version of these uh, virtual LED headsets because they by themselves are now much more capable. I will, if I have time, I'll find the picture and show it at the end. Um, this is how this looked like, again, similar to the, to the video from the beginning. Um, and where we have basically two participants, at least in this setup, it was that they were put in the same room uh, next to each other, uh, each driving their own car. And again, what you see on the, right, on the bottom right side is what the participant on the right side is seeing. And what you see on the bottom left is what the participant on the left side is seeing. They're driving through a scenario where the participant on the left side has a car blocking the way. As you can see here, the participant, the participant on the right side coming through the, uh, through the intersection, or through the uh, obstacle, and then they sort of negotiate their way through this. And so part of the development of the system was also sort of iteratively coming up with, um, with scenarios that would that would elicit these kinds of interactions. So coming up with scenarios that um, have some level of ambiguity in them to, uh, to, uh, to then see how people would resolve them. Just two, because I, I like explaining them because I think they're, they're easy to understand. Uh, scenario four was one where two participants would approach from two different points of, uh, from, from two different sides of an intersection and they were both tasked to go left. Um, they're both supposed to yield for the other person, or if they're both in this situation, the, the person arriving first should go first. Um, but as we can see later, this is not usually how this then took place. And then the other scenario that we just saw is scenario nine, and then the inverse scenario 10, where there is a, where one of the lanes is blocked and you need to negotiate who's going to go first. And we spend a lot of time playing with the timing of where participants would, of how participants would arrive such that an ambiguous situation would occur. We did not sort of adjust the speed of the car at all. So they, they, as soon as the cars drove, we didn't adjust the, the speed to create these, um, uh, these uh, interactions artificially. They just were played out. One of the things that we realized that was actually a huge problem for us is how do we even analyze this? So within the context of sort of driving studies and driving simulation studies, there are lots of measures that have been established, even as, uh, even as, even as SAE rules for this sort of, for this field. However, none of them or most of them, very few of them actually help us to understand how we look at interaction, like how it doesn't tell us anything about how interaction takes place. So after we had built the simulators and we had run the studies and collected the data, we then actually had to spend a lot of time figuring out how interaction takes place and uh, plays out. The way that we ended up doing this, uh, at least for this first version, is to render them as short animations. So what you see on the, on the left side of the screen is a map of this world. It's again the scenario where the lane is blocked, which is the car that's blocking the lane is the blue uh, rectangle here. Participant A that has to drive through the lane that is blocked is the red rectangle. Participant B is the green rectangle. And the field of view of the headset is indicated by this code. And you can see that they, are, that they, will, they will be like looking left and right. Um, as, uh, as the participants are, are turning their heads to look at their mirrors and the, and the environment. The, 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 the distance that's indicated here has, has nothing to say. We just picked a distance that looked visually pleasing. They can look into a really far distance. So uh, a participant that is down here can already see the other car coming. Here are also additional graphs that show the acceleration, uh, the acceleration and brake input, the steering input, and the vehicle speed. But I'd encourage you to not to pay too much attention to this um, but to look at the interaction as it plays out. Mm. 
you can you can see how the uh, participant from uh, participant A is sort of checking to make sure that it's actually free and safe to go by looking around uh, the shoulder and the mirrors. Just one more example because it's so fun. This is an example of where two participants are tasked to turn left and are supposed to uh, sort of interact with each other uh, and have to figure out who's supposed to go first. And you can see A is actually already at the intersection. And B is driving slow enough that A could just pass. But we can see here in this, interac in this interaction that A will only go once B has stopped. And then checking again that the road is free. And so we realized before we can discover any of these interactions in, these, in this data or in the interactions between this kind of data streams, we really need to come up with a way in which we can analyze, we can first sort of discover these interactions as this takes place. Um, because this was sort of the, the first implementation, we then uh, continued and built a, a new implementation that uses newer hardware, but also has a bunch of quality of life improvements. So one of the things you can see in the background is that the, the, the researcher now has an overview of what's actually going on in the study. Since the participants are wearing headsets, it's a little bit tough to know what's actually happening. So we built sort of ex, this uh, external view. We added things like scenario timers um, and things like that. Also now um, the participants are wearing the sort of updated versions of these headsets that already have hand tracking built in, making the whole system work much easier and much lighter. They also auto connect to the server. So there's a lot of things to make running studies easier in it. Um, and this is this is sort of how this looked like. We have the hand checking enabled and everything. Um, and then additionally, that's something that we also implemented that now because of the sort of new implementation that allowed us to do this as well, uh, that we did in in collaboration with uh, Harold Haraldson was to implement a system called rerun that allows us to record these interactions. So what I showed you earlier. Um, with the sort of top-down map views and map renders of the uh, of the interactions that took place, we decided actually why why don't we record kind of everything that's going on in the environment, record everything and then make it play back, make it a uh, make it able to to be played back, and so this is what we did with Rewan, where we managed to uh, set up a system that allows us to um, record these scenarios, play them back at different speeds. Uh, we can look at the different perspectives of the participants. So we have, uh, this, is, this is from participant A. We can have simulated views in the world. This is like a simulated pedestrian view, just sort of panning around, seeing how the same interaction that we just saw take place. Uh, how, how would this look like if you're a, a pedestrian in the world? And then also obviously from all of the different perspectives. So this is the view from uh, participant A. Uh, this is an outside view of participant A. And so on. And like we're not going to look at all of the details because it might it will definitely take too long. But again, we now have the capability to not only look at these interactions just from a top-down view, but we can look at them and see how interactions take place. We can scrub back and forth, similar how you would do sort of behavioral coding with videos, where you have like a video view. But now we can take on any view and see uh, how different perspectives uh, inform how interactions take place. Um, the kind of the results from Strangeland, and this is things. This is also a big thanks to the collaborators uh, that we have in, in Israel, specifically like Navid and uh, Carmel. We have actually been able to run over 200 participants in both the old and the new version of the driving simulator. And this is a data visualization that uh, Hauke made of the studies we we've run both in Israel and in uh, both in Israel and here in New York, New York City. Um, and it's like lots of data points and it's really exciting to see to have the system be picked up and be usable by people to actually collect data. Um, sort of to summarize, and I need to move a little quicker, uh, Strangeland is a shared virtual reality environment to assess the interactions between different uh, participants. It's a unity based simulator that can easily be modified. Uh, it's designed to capture naturalistic interactions between these traffic participants and now we're also one of the things we have is rerun, but we're also extending this now as a specific tool to support human behavior uh, analysis. So looking at the sort of overview, um, in the thesis uh, over the last five years, I've published multiple research platforms, was able to demonstrate the usability and sort of proliferate them by publishing lots of details around how to use the system and show that they're actually usable to generate uh, interesting results and like 
answer some of the research questions that we need to look at when looking at interaction between people and automation. Uh, and then beyond that, we also established a lot of the testing methods of like, how would you even look at these like new simulators? This is ultimately where we ended up with the different, with the different simulators. Strangeland, much closer to a lab study. Room uses a lot of the real world elements, but still retains the ability to construct the scenarios by visually, uh, um, by visually uh, replacing the field of view from the participant. Exa room very close to the to the instrumented world by just changing small elements. All of this work was uh, this was work was already published in in different conferences from Kai to UI and uh, journals. Um, and luckily, because it's been published early enough, because it's already been published, this research already has been picked up. So the digital twin and the room setup was used by Sharon et al from our lab to create a bus experience where participants uh, would drive in the, on the Roosevelt Island bus while wearing a VR headset and then experience sort of an alternate future or simulated future of the island. Frank um, has picked up the extra room simulator and extended it by uh, adding more advanced tracking features. And he could show that uh, re replicating um, in-lab studies in the real world is now also possible by having this more accurate tracking. And then Jiyun uh, picked up the uh, Strange Land simulator and added a whole bunch of features to it, including pedestrian tracking, autonomous vehicles. But that's for uh, for for her to talk about. Um, also, outside of Cornell Tech, we had the research pickup, so people already have like cited our work, which is really exciting to see. Uh, some work we might have inspired for some others. We might have just been a little faster in publishing it, um, but still, we're part of the conversation, which is really cool. Um, and this is how I'm coming to the end of my presentation. There are like a whole bunch of people on this list and there are probably people that have missed. If I've missed you, maybe sorry. Um, but like, yeah, I've not been doing this alone, of course. So there are lots of people that I have to thank. So thank you everyone, thank you. Um, and now thank you everyone for listening and paying attention for such a long time.